Some people are lucky enough to find their calling in life at a young age. Raised in Marrick, Long Island, USA, 23 miles from New York City, Michael Kors gave his first bit of sage fashion advice at the ripe age of five when his mother was deciding on the right wedding dress for her second marriage. Since then, Michael Kors has gone through a series of ups and downs, but has come out right on top. Today, the Michael Kors business has more than 500 stores in 94 countries, more than $2 billion in annual revenues, and a market capitalization of more than $18 billion. So how did he do it? It wasn't necessarily easy or straightforward. Kors enrolled at the Fashion Institute of Technology in 1977, but nine months later he left school and began working at an upscale store called Lothar's. There, he came into contact with the international jet set like Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, Rudolf Nurayev and Diana Ross, sowing the seeds for his own brand. By 1981, he began designing his own collection for Lothar's. This collection was spotted by Don Mello of Bergdorf Goodman, and soon the kid from Long Island was stocked at the venerable New York department store. A few years later, in 1984, Michael Kors held his first fashion show. It was very positively received, and the brand continued to grow. But when a recession hit in the early 1990s, the company was forced to file for bankruptcy protection. But Kors kept on going, and in 1997, he started designing for LVMH-owned Celine, the French sportswear brand, eventually becoming the brand's first creative director. LVMH also took a 33% stake in his business, providing some much-needed stability. When he was ready to focus on his own brand again, Coors exited his role at Celine and took on an investment from Silas Chow and Lawrence Stroll. But it was his star turn on the hit television show Project Runway that was the real game changer for Michael Kors, as his clever, humorous commentary on young fashion design contestants was beamed into households all over the United States and all around the world. Through Project Runway, the public got to know him much better, and as his profile grew, so did the business. His original investors made billions of dollars when, in December 2011, Michael Kors executed the largest ever fashion IPO, valuing the business at over $2 billion. In recent years, social media has made his relationship with the public grow even further. Michael Kors has been the fastest growing fashion brand on Facebook, and the brand has more than 17 million fans across social media platforms. Today, as he celebrates the opening of his first flagship store in China, we will hear his stories, advice, and experiences through all the ups and downs of building one of the fastest growing fashion brands on the planet. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and thank you to all of you tuning in on live. It's the day before a blowout Michael Kors event here in Shanghai, and I'm here with the man himself for a special live broadcast on the business of fashion as he celebrates the opening of his first major flagship in the largest luxury market in the world. We are here to learn about the incredible journey he has taken through professional ups and downs and all of the experiences had in building one of the biggest fashion businesses on the planet. All week, we have been taking questions on Twitter using the hashtag BOFLive, and you can continue to follow the conversation and participate using that same hashtag BOFLive throughout the interview. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. I wanted to start, you know, in the intro video that we saw earlier, um, we noted that your interest in fashion began at a very young age. And I want you to take us back, as far as you can remember, to your first interest in this industry, which you know, you've continued to work in for, for, for more than 30 years. How did you first take an interest in fashion, and how has that developed over time? Well, I, I, I have to say uh, there are perhaps a lot of families where, you know, if a, a, a little boy said, oh, I want to be a fashion designer, they would say, oh, please, why that? <laughs> How about a doctor? How about an engineer? How about, you know, in my family, it was the opposite. I grew up in a family of people who were 
really, a lot of them were first off in the fashion business. Uh, my grandfather was in the textile business. My mother was a model. Uh, my grandmother was a teacher obsessed with fashion. I think more obsessed with fashion than teaching. Um, and uh, an uncle who was a manufacturer. So talking about fashion at the table was something that was the norm. Shopping when you're an only child with a fashion-obsessed mother. I was her shopping partner. And, and I always loved to sketch. I think I was consistently drawn to the idea of designing something. You know, when I was really small, I would sketch cars and houses, and, but it always went back to fashion. My mathema mathematical skills weren't that fabulous, so I definitely wasn't going to build a house that would last. Um, and fashion and, and, and just the whole kind of transformation uh, when you found something great and something new when you shopped, that was my turn on. Um, I remember even when I was really small, uh, if we spent a day at the beach, uh, with my family, the most fabulous part of the day was, what are you going to change into at the end of the day <laughs> when you're finished with the beach, and what are you going to wear when you go out to dinner? Right. Uh, when you traveled on a vacation, a family vacation, what are you packing? Um, so that was always something that I loved. And then I realized by the time I was a teenager that this was just the life I was meant to lead. Um, I kind of always looked at people growing up and did my own makeover. I'm like, she should cut her hair. <laughs> she should wear more color. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I guess it served me well to know early on what I wanted to do. Yeah, and, and then you made the decision to go to the Fashion Institute of Technology. Yes. And after nine months, you chose to drop out. Mm -hmm. Take us back, you know, what was the decision first to attend a formal fashion school and then to decide, listen, that's not for me, I'd rather go work at this store, Lothar's? Well, the funny thing is, um, you know, I, I think we all think there are the ways you're supposed to do things. So I said, OK, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to learn how. I could sketch beautifully, but I could not sew at all. A disaster. Um, no patience. Sketching, I could do quickly. Sewing was being methodical and not for me. But I said, OK, I'm going to go to school. I'll graduate. I'll go to work for someone who I admire. I'll be their assistant. I'll pick up pins. I'll do all of that. I got to school, and suddenly I realized I was never going to be a brilliant seamstress. That was never going to happen. And I knew, even though I was 18, I knew what kind of woman I wanted to design for. I knew what the aesthetic was. And I actually had a teacher who said to me, you need to go out into the world. You're ready. You've got to get a job. You're going to be stuck if you stay here in school. You're going to learn more if you get out into the world. She said, I wouldn't tell this to most people. She said, but I'm going to tell this to you. And she said, if you have the right opportunity, grab it. And uh, starting, starting in retail, I got to design. I got to merchandise. I got to sell. I got to do displays. I really got to think about the whole experience, 360. That was your education. That was. And retail will always be my education. It's still my education. You know, I think that I always, I always think that a store, whether it's a, a brick and mortar store or it's online, I mean, this is a laboratory. Mm -hmm. It's a constant laboratory. So the education never stops. You know, we had a question come in on Twitter from uh, a young woman named Farah Vayani, who's from Nairobi, Kenya. And she said, do you still see value in a formal fashion education? Oh, I absolutely do. Listen, I, I'm heavily involved at FIT, in fact. Uh, we have an endowment set up, and, and we have a student every year that we follow their entire career. I think, though, the one thing you have to remember about fashion is there's no set rule. The minute you think there's a set rule in fashion, well, then it's not fashion. Uh, I mean, you know, we never thought people would wear bare legs in the winter. We never thought people would wear boots in the summer. Um, or that you could wear a t-shirt to a, to a black tie event. Um, so I think you start with the rules, but you have to know yourself. But certainly going to school, and I think going to school combined with the right job in the industry 
is still the way to set out for most people. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily look at me and say, okay, look what happened for him. Right. Um, I, I happened to have a first job that allowed me to, you know, kind of see so many things that I don't think most jobs would. Okay, so let's continue on your journey. You're at Lothar's and you start designing a collection for them. Yes. I, I want to get into your design process. You know, mm -hmm. you say sketching comes very easily to you. It does. Talk to us, you know, when you're coming up with a, you were just telling me backstage you're working on resort right now. Mm -hmm. Talk to us the, through the process for all of those people who want to understand how it works behind the scenes. How does a collection, a Michael Kors collection, come to life? Oh, there's so many different layers. I mean, first off, I always, you know, now that I've been doing this a long time, now I kind of feel that I'm on a journey with my customers. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to think about this closet. I imagine if she had this enormous closet that she never got rid of anything. And what would be something that would be exciting to add to the closet to change what she owns, to tweak it, to take her on this journey. So that's a part of it. Um, every day as a designer, some designers go to a museum and, you know, I don't know, there's, uh, there's a Jackson Pollock exhibit. And they see the Jackson Pollocks and they say, oh, splatter prints. I'm going to do splatter prints. And they work on their collection for three hours and they say, I've got to get it out. Every day my eye is traveling. So it's, it's constantly what you're experiencing uh, that's layered with knowing my customer and what works for their lives. Um, so travel's a huge part of it. Fabric, there's always something new. How do you fabricate something? We were playing around with the idea. I kept seeing women either carrying bags that were very structured and felt like rocks and they were too heavy or really soft and just had no structure and really didn't work. So I started working with my team who develop all of our leathers and I said, isn't there a way that we can bond suede to a very soft leather and give you a handbag that looks structured but is still soft? Mm -hmm. So the next thing you know, you have a different kind of handbag. So it's material, it's travel, it's pop culture. You know, I've done collections based on Amy Winehouse. Yes, it's true. <laughs> Subliminally, I, we didn't send it out looking like that, but there was just this kind of attitude in the air that I thought was right when I first heard her music. So it's pop culture, it's travel, it's my consumer, and it's fabrication. Okay. A big part of your brand DNA, and I know you spent some time talking about this earlier, is this idea of jet set. And mm -hmm. we were talking about your travel plans after here. I mean, just so you know, Michael's jetting off to Milan, and then he's going to Capri for a vacation. I mean, this whole idea of jet set, which you first kind of encountered at Lothar's when you're working there with all of these fabulous people coming through. You know, what, is, what is that jet set DNA? Because, you know, I have my own students at St. Martin's and I talk to them about knowing their customer and finding right. their own voice. Yeah. Your voice has been defined by this idea of this life around travel and jet set and this kind of... Totally. Tell us about that. What, why is that a distinctive positioning for you? Well, the funny thing is, I think when you... Uh, if you think about how the wealthy lived prior to the mid-60s, the wealthy lived a very slow, leisurely life. They traveled with trunks. They had hat boxes. Life was very slow and wonderful. And, and then there were the people who did all the work. Then suddenly the mid-60s came and the wealthy started living a fast life. So suddenly you weren't jumping on the plane with five trunks. You were you know, going to a business meeting in London in the morning and then you were able to jump on a plane and you know, go to Paris and have lunch. And then she could go to Stad and she could be skiing the next day. So her wardrobe had to en encapsulate all of that. And so I think it's the first time that we thought about the idea of practicality and glamour combined. Um, you know, and Jackie Kennedy was a big part of that, certainly. And I think that what's happened now in today's world, everyone's living a fast life doesn't matter if you get on a plane or you've ever been on skis in your life. The simple truth is we're plugged in 24-7. We're always on the go. We're moving quickly. 
But at the same time, we don't want to wear things that are banal and utilitarian. We still want indulgence. We still mm -hmm. want glamour. Um, and Jet Set is a kind of a perfect way to sum up how do you have both. And that's mm -hmm. why it, to me, is always compelling. I'm so intrigued to see how Angelina and Brad get off the plane. <laughs> I mean, the reality is the cameras are on. They've got to look great. Um, and at the same time, they're dealing with a lot of things. They've got a busy life. So whether you're Angelina and Brad or not, it's, it's all about that fast, busy life. I mean, that kind of takes me to my next question. I think it's really interesting how this idea of jet set is no longer you know, the, the sole exclusive right of the rich and famous. And now all of us lead global lives. Air, air travel has grown, and everybody can travel around and enjoy the world. Because an, and another big part of your brand, and a big part of the success of the brand, has been the positioning in the affordable luxury sector mm -hmm. of the market. So do you, was there a particular moment where you saw a, a market opportunity there in that particular segment to say, listen, this idea of jet set, it doesn't have to only be for the rich and wealthy. It can be for everybody. Well, it's sort of twofold. I mean, first off, I, when I think about you know, my own closet, that I would never consider wearing all clothes that are accessible and I would never consider wearing all clothes that are precious. You know, I wear a t-shirt, but I wear crocodile shoes. Um, I mix things up. Uh, and I think that suddenly everything became much more democratic, that the wealthiest people in the world wear vintage. Um, and someone who is just starting in the work, workforce saves up and they buy one handbag. So suddenly, it wasn't about money being the determining factor about your taste or your style. Um, the simple truth was that you finally had this opportunity to see that everyone lived that fast life. Everyone was interested in style, and people mix it up. Um, so, and that's just, uh, quite frankly, the internet changed that. You don't have to live in a big city. You don't have to live in New York or Shanghai or Paris or London or Milan to know what's happening. You're plugged in. You have the information. Mm -hmm. um, so everything became democratic. And I think we see a lot of our customers just mix things up. You know, I might have, a, it's funny, I have a, a client in New York who's very, very wealthy. And she buys Michael Michael Kors trousers from us. And she kind of buys them as disposables. She said, you know, she said, I leave them in the country house. I leave them here. I leave them there. And then for someone else who's just starting in the workforce, that's her one fabulous trouser. Um, and I love the idea that it can do both. That's, that makes sense. I mean, there was a, a particular moment in the early 1990s, which I mentioned also mm -hmm. in the intro, where things weren't going so well. You, this just, is true. you just introduced Michael by Michael Kors, I think. Kors. It Kors. was Kors back then. Right. Yes. And um, the economy took a turn for the worse. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the, the things that's true for many fa great fashion success stories is that you know, I think some people imagine that success comes really easily and it's a straight path. You know, but more likely, it's a circuitous path with a lot of ups and downs. When, when your business that you'd already worked more than 10 years um, to build at that stage was put into this state of bankruptcy protection, how did you react personally? You know, what was going through your head at the time? I think, you know, when it first happened, you know, I, at the time, I couldn't acknowledge uh, in my mind that we had a licensee who ended up owing us a lot of money. They didn't pay us. They went bankrupt. So it was kind of the house of cards. But I started blaming myself. And I said, oh, I said, maybe my clothes are too sporty. Maybe they're too simple. Maybe I have to make evening clothes. And I remember I had to work on my next season, and I started sketching and started thinking about it. And, and everyone said, well, evening clothes, no matter what, when the economy is bad, she'll still buy special evening clothes. So I started sketching all these crazy cocktail dresses. And I was looking at them, and I kept thinking, but why would you come to Michael Kors for that? 
Right. I said, well, you know, I've got to be true to myself. And I think it forced me to focus and, and, and say, wait a minute, find what makes you Michael Kors. Don't look over your shoulder. I think the big trick, you know, we used to laugh, fashion shows used to have the designer's name on the back wall many years ago. Um, and I think that now, in today's world, a lot of shows, you can look at a collection and you don't know whose show it is. Yeah. And that's a problem. So I think that you have to find a way to still evolve and always change and do all of that. But at the same time, you have to have a point of view. So when times get tough, you have to find yourself. You have to dig in and find yourself. So I basically, I remember at the time, I said, OK, no crazy cocktail dresses. We're going to do beautiful, chic, sleek, luxurious sportswear. It's what I do. So focus is important. We had a, another question from Liverpool, England this time, from okay. Chris Roberts. And he said, well, how did you overcome that setback? So you've just partially answered that. I did that. And I think at the time, I, um, I really went back to uh, the consumer. And I did a lot of personal appearances. I spent a lot of time in the stores to really hear what women had to say. Um, and it's funny, when a decade changes, it's not normally the first year that it changes. And we had come out of the 80s, and everyone was just you know, shoulder pads and jewels and glamour. And all of a sudden, the 90s were coming, and things were getting a little quieter. And you had to figure out, how is that going to happen? Um, so I spent a lot of time in the stores um, hearing what women had to say. The best thing a designer can do is you know, stand near their merchandise in a store, talk to people. Uh, watch them, see when they try something on, what works, what doesn't. Uh, and, and I think that's the best learning curve you have. And what did you learn? I learned that, quite frankly, uh, the sadness of grunge that happened, <laughs> that certainly wasn't going to be the answer for most women. Nor did they want to continue with the opulence that was obnoxious from the 80s, that you really had to find a blend and you had to find something that women still felt luxurious and glamorous when they put the clothes on, but weren't ostentatious, weren't in your face. It was a new decade. It's always changing. Um, and I think at first, the fashion world thought you know, that nose rings were going to be the answer. And after you had gone through Joan Collins and Dynasty, it was going to be a, a rough transition to nose rings and stomper boots. So how did you blend the two? And, and, and you see it when you spend time in the stores. And you don't have to even ask women. My job isn't to ask them what they want. I have to know what they want before they know it. But you can watch. You have to be a good observer. Okay. Um, continuing on through the journey, you know, one thing I wanted to spend some time on is Project Runway. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm, and I'm looking at it as an outsider. But for me, that was the moment where, you know, after having honed your point of view, after having better understood your customer, after having, you know, had your education at Lothar's and kind of had this foundation, that was the rocket ship that enabled you to take that, take your kind of perspective on things and, and really build a global profile on the basis of a, a, a television show that became extremely popular. How did you first get involved with Project Runway, and had you any idea what it was going to turn into? Well, uh, the two things that happened, um, I knew Heidi Klum socially. Uh, we weren't good friends, but we knew each other socially. I knew one of the producers on the show. Um, I'm certainly not shy. Um, I'm certainly kind of always have an opinion, and I'm brutal with my own things. I mean, I have people who work for me who are almost in tears. I'm like, it's hideous. I throw it out, uh, and we move on. But they approached me, and they said, you know what? We're going to do this television show talking about the design process. They explained it all. And initially, I said, you know what? It's reality television. I said, I said no way. I said, fashion is always made to seem like a joke. I said, it's really hard work. 
I said, I, you know, what are the designers going to be in the jungle eating bugs? And I said, no, 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 no. And they said, no, listen, you used to work with students at Parsons as a critic. And it's going to be that process, but it's going to be televised and you'll be taped. So we thought the first year, quite frankly, I said, you know what? A few fashion people will watch it. And, you know, maybe some guys who think Heidi is hot. And, and that's it. And I thought that'll be the end of it. I didn't think that the public would be that intrigued to see the design process. And I remember I was at a party and I ran into Rashida Jones, the actress, and she said, oh, I love Project Runway. I said, thank you. She said, my father loves it. And I said, Quincy Jones? <laughs> like Quincy Jones, Quincy Jones is watching Project Runway. And she said, my dad thinks it's so interesting to see nothing turned into something. So I think that you know, that became obviously a huge part of the success. I think people got to see why I think the way I think. And also fashion at the same time, truly I've always thought it was part of pop culture, but now suddenly it really was. Mm -hmm. You know, families watch together and vote. No, I know, out, 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 in, out. And suddenly people got to see uh, me as more than just an article they read in a magazine or they saw online. They got to see that this designer, this is why he thinks that way. And, you know, as a designer, quite frankly, it made me a better designer. I never go to fashion shows. I don't sit in a fashion show audience. Suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, edit, smooth, fast, quick, quick, pace, pace, pace. You know, I think my shows suddenly went from Years ago, they used to be a half an hour. Then they went to 15 minutes, 12 minutes. Now we're at seven. Um, and it's just the times we live in, speed it up. So you learned yourself from the process. Absolutely. I got to sit there as a journalist would. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. Um, you decided to leave after 10 seasons. Mm -hmm. well, you know, af you know, after that 10-year period, why did you know, you know this was the time to Simplistically, leave? time. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, there's just only so many hours in the day, and uh, my calendar is tight to say the least. And I, I enjoyed being, you know, with everyone on the show. We had a great time, and every episode we filmed was always a surprise. Um, but it's just there's only so many hours in the day. We did have one question from a, a young woman named Judy Lempke in London saying, "Can you please come back to Project Runway?" <laughs> is, is this something you would ever consider? Unless cloning becomes a possibility, Judy, um, I, think, I think perhaps a guest, a guest appearance here and there is about it that, that we can really handle at this point. Um, but it's, listen, the show, the show has also, I think, what's fabulous about the show. I grew up with the opportunity of having this family who were thrilled that I was in fashion. Do you know how many kids around the world I have heard that their parents are suddenly like, oh, this is a real job. Right. Like this is really a fabulous job and you can actually turn out to make a really great living if you're talented and you work hard. And I think that's amazing. It's opened it up to the entire planet. That's, that's entirely true. And I think this whole openness that we've seen in the last 10 years um, both through the internet and television and fashion becoming part of the mainstream has really, in a way, legitimized the industry and I think the way outsiders look at it. I totally think. I think that now it's not, you know, I think a lot of people, unless you really knew about it, a lot of people always thought that fashion was kind of fluffy. It's not important. It's not serious. You know, is that really a real job? And then suddenly I think now the internet and television, all of this has shown people this is, this is the business of fashion. This is, this, is, this is a lifetime love and pursuit. It's not just you know, a cherry. Exactly. Um, so through the period of Project Runway, um, and then starting when you, know, you took on a new investment, um, the business grew rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking at some of the numbers, and they are they're stunning numbers for a business of that scale to be growing that quickly. Mm -hmm. How did that change the way you, as the creative director and designer, had to work? As you know, the business is growing, you know, 
60, 70, 80 percent a year. How did, how did that change things for you inside? Because all of a sudden, you're reaching a global audience, you're designing for you know, multiple different lines, multiple different collections. You know, it's a lot of work, as you've you know, rightfully pointed out. You know, how does that change the way you have to work? Well, I have to say, it's, it's a strange thing that everyone says, well, when you're young, you have all this energy and endurance. And, and the simple truth is, you think that. But in fact, I kind of feel like an athlete that when I, it's reversed. You know, athletes, as they get older, do they have the endurance? Designers, as you get older, you've experienced more. You've seen more. Um, when I think about when I was 25, I thought I was busy. And in fact, I actually wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was actually pretty smooth. Um, I think the older I've gotten, I've kind of stepped it up at each level of experience. You know, uh, working on Celine for seven years, I learned about how to make decisions and be in more cities at once to think about a global business. Um, and it, it kind of develops your skin to take you to the next step. Um, even Project Runway, the simple truth is, to be that opinionated that quickly, I was never scripted. I had to sit there. It comes out fast. What do you think? Well, so today, when I'm working on the amount of things that I'm working on, I have to have a sharp, quick opinion. I have to be a problem solver. Um, I have to be always curious. And because it's always changing, that's what keeps me curious. If it stayed the same, I'd be bored, quite yeah. frankly. So you want to see a change. You want to see something new. Um, but it all really goes back to Lothar's. I've always consistently designed for whatever I designed to actually be worn. Right. I mean, no matter what we send down the catwalk, people actually buy it. Right. We sell it. You know, I think there are so many fashion shows that none of it's produced. You know, it's just for the show, and I think that's, that's perfect for some designers. It's just not how I operate. So now I'm just doing it on a much grander scale, but it's always been my point of view. You know, when I see someone wearing it, I know I did my job well. So we're in China. Yes. And this is your first trip to mainland China. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the market here. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking earlier with some of your team about you know, the plans for growth here in China. And w with a business that's growing this quickly, you know, you need the different growth factors. Some of that can come from creating new collections or new types of products, and some of that comes from geographic expansion. Mm -hmm. What do you see? I mean, you, I know you've only been here for 24 hours, but what do you see as the opportunity here in, in what's very quickly becoming the largest luxury goods market in the world? Listen, I think for fashion, uh, the two greatest things as far as a market uh, can be concerned you know, as a designer, some in the fashion business, I'm concerned with, with markets where people are curious and thirsty. And the Chinese consumer is curious about what's next, what's new. And when you think about a fast life, well, this is the epicenter of a fast life. Um, I, and I'm always intrigued to design for that kind of consumer. You know, this is a market that's always changing, uh, and that kind of change is about speed. So if you're thinking about speed and, and, and just what's next and what's new, that's why I'm intrigued to be here, um, because you see that here. You know, as a New Yorker, it's you know, the city that doesn't sleep. Well, New York is quiet and sleepy compared to Shanghai. <laughs> so so you, know, you really have to acknowledge that. Um, and I think, though, as a New York designer, we've always had this pragmatism. New York designers have a pragmatic side to them. Working in Paris on Celine, I learned about an indulgent side. And the balance of the two is probably what makes a market like China so exciting, because I think that what works here is that balance of the two, certainly. 
Okay. We, we actually had a, a question come through on Twitter from one of our interns at BOF in London, who's from Thailand. Okay. And she said, China is entering a period of luxury cool down. So why have you decided to open your first major flagship store here now? Well, to be honest with you, um, I still think newness counts for a, a lot here in China. So I think that you have a cool down on some brands that have been here for a long time that people are bored with. Um, I think that as an American house, I approach things differently. I'm not a heritage house. We've never made couture. We don't have, we don't, that's not what we do. We're not selling you the dream of, you know, a 1950s couture evening gown. My heritage started in 1981. So I have a modern perspective. And also, quite frankly, we are dealing with uh, a mix of product that we have a range of prices that makes us accessible to a huge range of people. Um, so I think the slowdown, if there's uh, a, a slowdown, I think it's an opportunity. Um, we've talked a little bit about the internet already, but I, I did want to spend some time specifically talking about social media. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's been part of the industry for more than 30 years, uh, you know, and seen this opening up of the industry that's come through a variety of different um, media, social media is probably one of the most interesting because it's, you know, now a brand like Michael Kors, a designer like Michael Kors, doesn't need to rely on, you know, Vogue, or a television show or advertising to communicate with the customer. Um, Michael Kors, as a brand and as a, as a designer, can communicate directly with that consumer. Talk to us a little bit about that shift and, and how you think that's changed the way, you may, perhaps as a brand, you've approached your communication and engagement with consumers. Well, I have to, I have to really go back to my original, you know, starting point in fashion and think that, you know, there I was designing product for this one shop on Fifth Avenue. I would bring it into the store. I would put it on the mannequin in the window. A woman would walk in and say, well, I love the dress that's on the mannequin. The next thing you know, I'm working with her, putting the belt on her, fixing it, hemming it, doing all of that. And then that progressed to personal appearances, what we call trunk shows in the States, and hearing women's feedback. Um, as we've grown, uh, it would be impossible for me to do personal appearances everywhere where you could buy Michael Kors. But social media is allowing me to have this constant dialogue that's fantastic. Because, you know, you, you can experiment, I don't know, with I don't know, let's say I decide that, you know, green, I'm in the mood for green, I love green. And everyone says, yeah, but you know, women don't buy green handbags. And I'm like, no, but I really love green. So the next thing you know, we decide, when you have your own stores, I can experiment. We can put green handbags in the stores. And I can post a great photograph that we've done of a green handbag, and I can post it on Instagram immediately she votes. And she's like, I love the green bag. The green bag is great. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I'm like, well, I'm not crazy. <laughs> green is the new color that you should have in a handbag. And why do bags always have to be neutral? Why can't we have green bags? So it's an unbelievable way to communicate globally with this customer. And I think also to take them on a journey uh, tell them about my life. Why do I think the way I think? Uh, I was at the Met Ball on Monday night in New York. Most people are not going to be able to go to the Met Ball. Um, the fact of the matter is, they got to go to the Met Ball with me. Isn't that a fabulous opportunity? Um, and I think, that, I think that it's conversation is so great for a designer. So if you can't talk to people on the street, in every city because it's impossible, you can communicate, you know, so many different ways now. How does it actually work for you though? Are you literally using Instagram yourself and checking it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Some of them are my specific personal, because I'm just nuts about something. Yeah. Some of them are things that my team and I work on together that I'll say, you know what, I really want to do a whole thing on bright color. I really want to do a whole thing on polka dots. Mm -hmm. I want to do a, you know, am I sitting and shooting at all? Absolutely not. It would be impossible. Um, but a lot of it is just, what, are, what am I feeling for at a given moment? Um, and it changes. I'm not particularly one of these people who thinks that people need to see, you know, an Instagram photo of my hamburger. Right. You know, I mean, and, and, and I don't bemoan anyone for doing that. If that works for them, that's great. But that's not what I'm interested in. Because uh, this is really all about the journey about why I design what I design, what I think is important at a given moment, what I'm excited by. Um, but you know, it's not me laying in bed and shooting my foot and posting it. I got it. Never got will it. be. Well, I felt like I was with you at the Met Ball with Zoe Saldana on the, well, on exactly. the red carpet. And that's, so. that, that's, that's different. Mm -hmm. That's a fun moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, and it's, it's a hard thing in today's world to, to be open but still have some privacy. You know, and I know a lot of actors and musicians who struggle with this. It's really hard because, you know, you could be an actress who's getting ready to go to an event. Do you, do you Instagram every part of the process as your eyelash goes on, as your earring goes on, as the shoe is buckled? You know, I mean, so, and, and we're all grappling with it, um, but I think it's whatever's right for, you know, the brand, and sometimes the actress or the performer is the brand. I'm going to turn to some of the questions that we've had come through. A lot of them, Michael, okay. were from young, aspiring fashion designers, young people who've seen you on TV or followed your brand. <clears throat> One of them came from Stephanie Moreno, an aspiring designer in Australia. And she said, you know, what, what's it like to work in the high-end fashion industry? You know, basically, what is it like to be Michael Kors? It's exhilarating because, I mean, I look down, I get excited. You're carrying a Michael Kors handbag. You have a Michael Kors handbag. I mean, I could look through the room. I'm always, you're in head to toe Michael Kors. You look great. Um, <laughs> but the reality is uh, it's exhausting and exhilarating at the same time. I always tell everyone, it's like people say to me, why aren't you nervous backstage before a show? I, I'm, you know, at this point in life, I'm not nervous, I'm excited. The minute the show is over though, I feel like I jumped off a cliff. So it's exhilarating. Um, but it's, it's something that you, you have to have the, the tenacity. You have to be able to really have the strength and the tenacity to stay in the game, you know, if you want it to be a long-term thing. But it's, it's certainly fun, I always tell people, being a designer and being successful, I don't have to be Brad and Angelina and have packs of paparazzi chasing me. People say, can I get an Instagram picture? Can I get a selfie? You know, that's lovely. And do you people, like that? For the most part, as long as people are polite. As long <laughs> as they're polite. When people try to shoot you without asking, it's a little strange. Um, but for the most part, fashion fame means you get a nice table and people are very sweet. <laughs> so the life is good. The life is good, absolutely. Right. Uh, Sophie Wilkinson in London says, do you ha have any advice for emerging designers, something perhaps that you wish you knew beforehand? That I knew beforehand? No, I, would, I don't regret anything that's happened. I, I don't regret, even when, if I've had a collection that didn't get great reviews, that's fine. You have to go through everything to get to the next step. Um, so I, d I don't have any sort of regret about anything. Everyone has to do things their way. I've been very kind of slow and steady in building up kind of, and then, you know, really putting my foot on the gas and, you know, and seeing everything explode. But I had a lot of experience leading up to that. But I don't think that there's one way to do things. 
I think everyone has to follow their own journey and their own path. So for Sophie, if you were giving her advice and she was... Retail. Okay. Retail. Retail, retail, retail. I think that every designer, when they're starting out, makes a huge mistake. You know, one of the things that would drive me crazy on Project Runway, I would look at the clothes and I'd say, well, who's your customer? Inevitably, she owns an art gallery. Yes. I'm like, wow, there's this huge market for art gallery owners. Fabulous. Yeah. I'm like, really? Doesn't Ray Kawakubo have that covered? Yeah. You know, I mean, there are designers who answer that. Why are you going to be in business and how are you going to grow and exist? So I think if you spend time in a retail store while you're in school, while you're starting a business, you get to see why do people buy what they buy. When someone tries something on, what kind of woman is attracted to it? How do you know who your customer is going to be? So a retail, retail, retail. If you lock yourself in a room with your friends, you have no idea what's going on. It's so funny that you talk about the art gallery thing. I was with my, I did a class at uh, St. Martin's last week, and they have to talk about a marketing strategy, and everyone is going after art gallerists. So it's the same problem in London as the in gallerina. New York. The gallerina is just, in every city, there's just these armies of gallerinas all around the world. Uh, there's a question from Desmond and Dempsey, also in London, and they're saying, what do you see as the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for young brands in 2014? Well, I think the biggest challenge, quite frankly, is that in today's market, it's very easy to get noticed quickly when you have nothing to back it up. So the simple truth is, don't think you have to put on a fashion show right away. Don't try to make a full collection. Focus on something that's specific, whatever it might be. Who knows, maybe it's just amazing socks. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's evening gowns that fit in an envelope. I don't know. But find something that's small and focused. I think the biggest thing is, how do you do something that you feel in your gut and at the same time, when you look at the marketplace, is it missing? Because if you can't answer the question differently, no one will care. So don't delude yourself that you're going to you know, have a fashion show, everyone's going to love you, you're going to be amazing, and blah, blah, blah. The simple truth is you have to answer a question differently. Because if you can't, then you won't last. You'll get noticed. You know, When I started, there, there, it was the opposite. You actually, it was hard to get noticed. Now it's easy to get noticed, it's hard to last. And the biggest opportunity? Opportunity? Opportunity to me. Well, I have to say that I think that we have not yet at all uh, fully explored how can we find things that are greener, um, that do not uh, sacrifice style, do not sacrifice how things feel. Um, we scream at the textile and yarn people constantly. It's hard to get them to move. They will. Um, and I think that's a huge, huge opportunity. But it's slow going. Um, uh, but I think, you know, I think that's something that we're going to see grow and grow. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I'm afraid we've run out of time. These things always seem to go so fast, and there's so many other things that uh, I hoped we could cover. But thank you for taking the time to, to talk with us during this busy trip. And um, thanks to all of you for coming. And we hope to see you on our next talk, live talk on the business of fashion very soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.